In June 1940, a virtually defenseless Britain faced the threat of a German invasion. The English Channel was all that stood in Hitler's way. Across it in northern France, most of Britain's heavy weapons lay abandoned. The German army had killed 11,000 of Britain's best troops there. Another 50,000 British soldiers were imprisoned. The Royal Air Force had suffered heavy losses. The Royal Navy remained intact and strong, but the Navy alone could not prevent an immediate German invasion. If Britain had surrendered, it would have been the end of the war in Western Europe. But the invasion never took place because of a major blunder by Adolf Hitler himself. Hitler was so determined to defeat France, he paid little attention to Britain's resistance. He made no preparations for an invasion and ultimately missed the opportunity to launch one. This oversight was ultimately fatal. On May 10, 1940, Hitler invaded Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. The British and French had been expecting this move since the previous autumn, but their preparations to meet the attack were insufficient. The German blitzkrieg was unstoppable. The Low Countries were quickly overrun. After just six weeks of fighting, the French army, which seemed formidable on paper, surrendered. The majority of the British expeditionary forces in France managed to withdraw in the evacuation of Dunkirk. They returned with little more than their rifles. Hitler now had much of the European continent under his control. He was convinced that Britain, the lone survivor, would not continue to fight. Hitler's U-boats were poised to cut off the maritime communications that were Britain's lifeline. His triumphant Luftwaffe were standing by to bomb towns and cities throughout the British Isles. Hitler was certain that Britain would ask for an honorable peace rather than risk destruction. After the fall of France, Hitler even disbanded 17 of his infantry divisions. It seemed a relatively effortless victory. The Führer and his people celebrated the end of the fighting in the West. Across the English Channel, the mood was quite different. Throughout June of 1940, Winston Churchill worked tirelessly to rally the British and organize a defense against the German invasion. Contrary to Hitler's belief, peace was not on the British agenda. By July 1st, 1940, Hitler realized he might have to use force to subdue his one remaining enemy. He began preparations for a cross-channel invasion, but set no date for it. He merely raised it as a possibility. General Franz Halder, Chief of Staff of the German Armed Forces Supreme Headquarters, was responsible for the plan. Halder began with the mistaken premise that the invasion was little more than a river crossing. The German army had proved adept at these during the French campaign.
Halder ignored the fact that the English Channel was one of the world's most unpredictable bodies of water. Four years later, the Allies would realize this when they planned their own cross-channel invasion at Normandy. Halder had planned to send German forces from his Army Group A ashore at Ramsgate and other ports on the coast of Kent. Army Group A troops would also land on the Sussex coast and the Isle of Wight. Finally, German divisions from Army Group B would land on the Dorset coast near Lyme Regis. Halder's invasion plan blanketed some 200 miles of coastline. But Grand Admiral Erich Raeder, the German naval commander-in-chief, objected to this plan and made it known to Hitler. Four months earlier, the German Navy had suffered heavy losses in Norway. Now, all the Raider had at his disposal were two modern battle cruisers, two elderly battleships, four cruisers, and a few destroyers. He said this was insufficient protection for an invasion across such a wide front. The Royal Navy, on the other hand, still had four battleships, two battle cruisers, two aircraft carriers, plus numerous cruisers and destroyers. Faced with British naval superiority, Raider could not guarantee security for the German invasion fleet as it crossed the Channel. He feared the Royal Navy might destroy his fleet before a single German soldier reached English soil. The German Navy also had no landing craft that could put troops and equipment on hostile beaches. This undercut Raider's faith in the plan. Hitler, however, overruled Raider. On July 16th, Hitler issued the directive for Operation Sea Lion. Preparations had to be completed by August 16th, just a month away. It was an impossible challenge. In mid-July of 1940, Hitler's Luftwaffe began to harass British ships in the English Channel and attack ports in southern Britain. Hitler hoped these demonstrations of air superiority would convince the British that further resistance was useless, making Operation Sea Lion unnecessary. Unintimidated, the British continued to watch and wait. On July 19th, three days after he issued his Sea Lion Directive, Hitler spoke at the Reichstag. Hitler accused Churchill of being an obstacle to peace and saw no reason why this war must go on. Hitler's hopes were immediately dashed by the British government's outright rejection of his peace offer. Preparations for Operation Sea Lion proceeded. Germany scoured the inland waterways of Western Europe, looking for barges, the only flat-bottomed vessels it could get to make beach landings. These were assembled in Dutch, Belgian, and French ports. But the Germans realized these barges could not navigate the channel under their own power. Some would have to be towed. Others were hastily fitted with aircraft engines to boost their power. Some were specially adapted to carry tanks and other heavy vehicles. With so much to be done, it became clear that Sea Lion's deadline of August 15th could not be met. On the last day of July, Hitler held a conference at his Bavarian retreat, the Berghof, 
Raider once again advised a narrower invasion front. With so many German preparations for Operation Sea Lion still incomplete, Raider also said the invasion of Britain should be postponed until May of 1941. Hitler disagreed, but he did push back the deadline for the operation's advance preparations to September 15th. The deciding factor in whether Sea Lion would subsequently be launched or postponed depended on Hermann Goering and his Luftwaffe. The planners recognized an invasion of this scope could only succeed if Germany ruled the skies over southern England. The Luftwaffe now mounted a concentrated attack to destroy the Royal Air Force. Hermann Goering assembled his air commanders to plan Eagle Day, a massive onslaught designed to give the Germans the necessary air supremacy over Britain. Poor weather delayed the attack. In Britain, Every week the invasion was delayed was a bonus. Defenses along the English south coast were strengthened. Mobile reserves were organized to counter the threat of Germans on the beaches. At the end of May 1940, a part-time local defense force known as the Home Guard was formed. Its ranks rapidly swelled. Some of its members were old, but they were long on determination. Production of Spitfire and Hurricane fighters was up. The RAF Fighter Command was growing in strength. Ingenious weapons for repelling invaders were also in development. One idea was to set the sea afire with burning oil to prevent a German landing. In July, the Luftwaffe's operations over the English Channel forced the Royal Navy to withdraw all warships larger than destroyers for fear they would become casualties. Even so, once Sea Lion appeared imminent, the home fleet quickly steamed south from its anchorage at Scapa Flow, north of Scotland. On August 12th, the German air offensive on southern England began. The first targets were fighter airfields and vital early warning radar stations on England's southern coast. But Goering made a grave error by shifting attacks away from radar stations and onto airfields and aircraft factories. Meanwhile, the debate between the German Navy and Army over a narrow versus a wide invasion front continued. Eventually, a compromise was reached. The frontage would be narrowed, but not by as much as the Navy wanted. An assault from Cherbourg was cancelled, and the westernmost landing point was now Worthing, England. This meant that only one German army group would carry out the invasion, a group commanded by Gerd von Rundstedt, who had little confidence in Sea Lion. Von Rundstedt recalled that Napoleon wanted to invade Britain via the English Channel, but decided it was too difficult. So von Rundstedt did not think Sea Lion could succeed. He went on leave when preparations reached a critical stage. His lack of faith 
did not bode well for Sea Lion. On August 14, 1940, Commander von Rundstedt's doubt in Operation Sea Lion was reinforced when he and other senior officers received Field Marshal batons from Hitler, rewards for the campaign in France. Hitler told the newly promoted Field Marshals he would not mount Sea Lion if the risks were too great. Invasion was not the only way to defeat Britain. At the Berghof Conference at the end of July, Hitler had said that Britain's best hope lay in Russia and the United States. If Russia was vanquished, the US would soon drop out of the picture, leaving Britain without a future. He therefore intended, in the spring of 1941, to destroy the Soviet Union. Yet, Hitler had still not abandoned the idea of invading Britain. Twelve days after Hitler's speech to his generals, Franz Halder, the author of the original plan, noted that interest in sea lion had increased. The forces involved had stepped up their training. Meanwhile, the RAF and the Luftwaffe were engaged in a fierce struggle. Casualties were high on both sides. At the end of August, the Germans were convinced that half the British fighter force had been destroyed. Yet RAF fighter command showed no signs of cracking, and resistance was as fierce as ever. On the ground, reinforcements ensured that any German invasion attempt was turned back. RAF bombers also began to strike at the buildup of landing barges at ports along the Channel and North Sea. With no detectable weakening of Britain's air defenses, Field Marshal Keitel, Hitler's chief of staff, issued a directive on September 3, 1940, postponing Sea Lion until the 21st of the month. More postponements followed, but on September 14th, Hitler rescheduled Sea Lion for the 27th, the last time the Channel's winds and tides would permit a crossing. By now, Goering had begun bombing Britain by night. On the 15th of September, Goering made one final desperate attempt to destroy the RAF Fighter Command by light of day. It was a failure. The Luftwaffe lost twice as many aircraft as the British. Two days later, Hitler postponed Sea Lion indefinitely and turned his eyes east to the Soviet Union. Contrary to what many observers believed, Britain had survived and would fight on. This meant that as of June 1941, when Hitler's forces invaded the Soviet Union, Germany was committed to war on two fronts. Hitler's armies would fight an ever more grueling campaign in the East. In the West, Germany had to guard against invasion from Britain, which was destined to come.
This was especially true once the United States was drawn into the war, something that would not have happened if Britain had given up in the summer of 1940. Hitler's failure to think ahead and develop a timely plan to ensure Britain's early defeat after the fall of France was a grave blunder. When he finally realized the need, he seriously misjudged the mood of the British people in his belief that the twin threats of his Luftwaffe and U-boats would cow them into submission. He also allowed Britain too much time to organize its defenses. This meant that Sea Lion's chances of success steadily decreased until finally it became impossible.